you ever find yourself in the past lamenting something you did or living in a past failure? I do. You ever find yourself in the future afraid of what might happen? <gasps> the future. I've been there. But now is the fucking way. Right now. Here. Now. The present. That's where it all actually happens. That's where freedom lies. That's where you can alleviate all of that stress, all of that guilt now. And that's what Corey Allen's new book, Now is the Way, is all about. And he's been practicing and cultivating this for years. You've probably heard him on my podcast before, and it's a pleasure and honor to have him back on again. Corey motherfucking Allen, you're back, and you did cool shit. I never left. <laughs> you never <laughs> left. You've been quarrying along. I've just been, there, you yeah. are quarrying along. Yeah, and now a, a book is here. Yep, it that's happens. cool. It's really cool. It, it emerged out of me without me noticing. That's a lie. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a lie. Everybody, there it is. Corey's first lie on, <laughs> on the podcast. Well, I usually try and like I have this whole thing of trying to be, you know, have integrity and all that stuff and and be honest and and nice and I don't know, man. I just got this wild hair that I'd flip it all inside out for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'll let's just, just like, fucking talk <laughs> mad shit. Yeah, just lie and just bullshit each other. <laughs> yeah, that's what the, I was for the whole time. That's what I was thinking. In this right now, it, this is a lie. Me talking about <laughs> joking about doing it. So I'm actually wow, doing it. We're getting really meta. I need to invite Godzi in here so we can understand the layers. Uh, I'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll dig some weird stuff out of his childhood and he'll shut down and go in the corner and cry. It'll take like three minutes so how are you uh, <laughs> man i'm good Corey. i'm aubreying along nice i'm aubreying on on the on the path to learning you know it's like it's just really interesting when you recalibrate yourself towards not the goal but just understanding that we're the unborn and the undying consciousness presence whatever your vocabulary permits we're just here to learn shit right like that's the whole thing and then like Whatever it takes to learn is just your way to learn. And we have all these value propositions about whether it's better or worse. But if we're here to learn, we just learn. You mm -hmm. know? And, uh, and like when I was talking with East Forest on a podcast recently, he's like, yeah. And the good news is everybody graduates. Right. You mean by dying? Well, maybe not this life. <laughs> yeah. But like imagine all the lives yeah. that we'll get. Or right, maybe this life we don't learn shit. Well, I mean, we learn a little bit, but maybe we go in the other way and it's like the denial. Mm -hmm. And we're learning about the pain of the denial of who we truly are. Yeah. And that's what we learn in this life. And maybe in the next life, we learn something else. Maybe in the next one, and maybe in the next one, and maybe in the next one. But like inevitably, eventually, with infinity as your fucking frame of reference, we all graduate. Right. I tend to think of it more nowadays as like the awareness that that is happening is the graduation. Yeah. So, so when you click onto that path and that way of thinking, then you're good. Like, you, okay, you did it. That's the hardest part of it. Ah. And then from there out, it's just the allowing everything to unfold. That's an even that's an even better add on. We're like bolting on, <laughs> we're like bolting on better ideas. Is that's this important it. concept because that is, of course, yeah. Because if if the process is learning, you know, and you really understand that, and that's what you're doing, then of course the graduation is understanding that you're in the process because it's just a process, and there may actually not be a hard graduation date. Mm -hmm. You know, it may just be the understanding that we're the unborn and the undying here to learn and yeah, let's exactly. learn in all the ways that we can and all the winding little rivers and roads and ways that we can and let's fucking learn and let's be try to do it like with our eyes the eyes all three of them open <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> you know yeah while we're fucking doing that yeah exactly this is like the you can't i don't think you can get to the graduation point because we are nested if you want to look at it, as our bodies or our, our bodies with spirits or source or whatever inside of them however you want to frame it we're nested within the ecosystem of what is and of being. And since that thing is a self-organizing system, which is perpetually shifting in, in and out of chaos at all times, since we're inside of that and that thing is always shifting, the terrain in which we experience and how we draw in life through our nervous system, through our mind's eye, as you said, and how we integrate our experience is always in a state of fluctuation. And that's a, the other day whenever we were talking and I was talking about how I had this raise of awareness around expectation and how expectation is a, a form of entitlement. We mm -hmm. expect the world to be a certain way, right? But 
the world is simply the world. The way what we expect it to be is our idea. And so what happens is that people get an idea of how they want the world to be or something they want to bring into the world and they try and express it and have it be held by the world because to get something out of your body, it must exist outside of yourself, right? So people try and externalize this idea that they had and then in order for the thing to take shape, it must take shape in the shape of its container, which is being. And that's whenever most people get disappointed, they tend to give up, they get frustrated because their fingerprints all over that idea that they had Half, half of those have to go away because it must be held. The thing must be held by the mm. container of being. And so, and that could be creating a company. That could oh, be creating anything. a relationship. relationship. That could yeah, be yeah. creating your own self-growth. That could be yeah. creating, yeah, I'm going to be this and I'm going to do this. And then it's like the world's like, well, we're yeah. in the world. Yeah, it's, and, well, it's a handshake, right? It's yeah. like you can't go to shake someone's hand and then be like, no, I'm going to shake both of my hands and you watch. <laughs> you know, that's what people are expecting. Right? <laughs> and so, and so to, to solve and that. And you know what? <laughs> also, like some people promise that in this kind of kind of new age manifestation. This, yeah. is, this is the secret kind of movement. It's like you're almost being promised that you get exactly what you want. It's like the old fallacy of prayer, yeah. you know, which is like, I'll like pray and it'll happen like exactly this. Like I want the red Bentley with the blah, blah, blah. blah. Well, like maybe, you yeah. know, like, like maybe well, also if the funny universe wants that. to shake your hand, like <laughs> yeah. give, you the, give you the red Bentley yeah. dabs. You and know? what's funny about that is that you, if you actually do just like 10 seconds of self inquiry around a major desire that you have, you'll see just how, what a wisp of nothing that you, you've spent no time actually thinking about it. So if someone spent so much of their life with this, like, I want to get the, I want to have a, a big company and do this and that and that. It's like, cool. Well, what's that company going to look like in five years? They're like, um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't actually. I'm not sure. I just want, you know, power and money and like. Well, oh, what's yeah. that? What's that look like? Like, what is that? Like, I have no idea. It's like, well, then don't get frustrated when it's not coming into existence. You've done zero planning or thinking about the idea. You just have a bunch of random desires and notions that you know are fleeting, and you're getting frustrated because they're not coming into being. And a weird sense of entitlement that you already should have. It, exactly. Which is what the ego loves to do. Like yeah. the ego will always whisper in your ear, like the little devil that it often <laughs> conspires with would yeah. be like you deserve this already bro mm -hmm. like if you were running you're this, a good boy if you were running this country everything would be fixed <laughs> yeah. man like if you would just they would just make you president of course the system's biased you know of you're, course. you're fucked you can't make it but if, if you were bro yeah you would be running this shit right you know yeah. and like if you were running the ufc or if you were on top of this thing like you would be killing it like we are always being told these like entitling things but and then we just sit back and fucking watch Pornhub and jerk <laughs> off into oblivion into the night. Into oblivion <laughs> into the fucking. I love the idea of like <laughs> Doctor Strange like opening one of those <laughs> <laughs> those portals and <laughs> all loads must go through the yeah. portals. Someone sitting there in Siberia like what the what? <laughs> How many times uh -huh. can I jerk off tonight and yeah. still maintain erectile efficiency? Yeah, smash integrity. cut over to that that two fingered ring of his. It's all disgusting. Like <laughs> Jesus. There's more Doctor Strange than we thought. Anyway, so the the way to the way to solve that problem that we're talking about is to change that expectation from expecting the world to bend to your will to intention, and that because that is a form of self priming. So whenever you change your intention to okay, I'm going to define and understand what it is I'm trying to do in the world. And then when the world bends and twists and everything as it does, I'll be aware and be prepared to not only move with it, but join it in its movement and learn from it. Because in the same way that half of your information is missing, when you just have this nebulous you know, wisp of an idea that you go try and create in the world, the other half of that it, you'll be, will be discovered through planting that seed into the fertile soil of what is, right? Mm. And so you have to pay attention to what, you know, as you try and put something out into the world, as you try and build a company or write a book or a relationship or whatever it is, be open and listen to the feedback you're getting from creating that thing through your intention that you've set and then learn from that and integrate it into your knowledge base and your action. And that way you are swimming with the force of the river. Right. And Joe Dispenza talks about this in a, in a really beautiful way. He talks about the difference between intention and surrender, right? Because these are two and seemingly opposite ideas. Intention means of using your will 
the will of the mind, the mm-hmm. will of your ability to to manifest something into creation, your intention to do something. And then surrender is allowing what will be to be. And and he talks about setting your intention and then surrendering to your greater mind or to the greater will of the universe, the greater collective, to allow it to come to be in a way that can potentially be a lot more interesting, magical, wonderful than you ever even imagined yeah. if you're willing to surrender once you set the intention, then surrender. It's like a it's like a psychedelic journey. That's why it's such a great metaphor for all of these things in life. My intention is to heal things with, you know, my childhood, blah, blah, blah. And like maybe it goes there. Let's say it does go there. May, but it goes there in such an interesting and unique way and this beautiful way. And you're talking to somebody with a crocodile head who's explaining things in this rant. Like, whoa, that was way cooler than yeah. I thought it was going to be just yeah. because you surrender and let it go. Or maybe it's like, yeah, actually your childhood's good. But what you really need to worry about is like this thing that's going on. Sure. Like, so you surrender to that. And that's also like exactly how it is with writing a book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come out with that. I'm sure you came out with a book proposal. You know, you you went to Penguin. Penguin's like, sweet. And that book proposal looks nothing fucking like this current book. Same same title. (laughs) Same title, which could have changed too, right? You know, like very, very easily could have changed. Yeah. And that was the same way with mine. I rewrote my shit seven times. Like I wasn't even close. Did you delete everything and start fresh or did you re- rewrite? Well, the fr- well, I mean, there was some parts of the outline that like stayed, but just got redone. But uh-huh. the whole structure of it got fucking just ravaged and most of it trashed. Yeah. Like uh, at least the first two times, like the next few times were more you know trying to a little bit more subtle like putting the structure into play having the different sections that actually guided you through it but um but yeah i mean that was just surrendering to what it what this book wanted to be or Mm -hmm. what a podcast wants to be or what on it wants to be i mean i fucking started on it as a hangover supplement (laughs) i remember you know (laughs) like that was not what this thing was meant to be and supposed to be and my you know all of these things like set your intention and then surrender to what actually will be yeah and that's a great analogy because how i thought of this is it sounds almost like um like like a trick or something but in order to take control you have to let go and what that means is that to translate that out of weird language (laughs) gobbledygook is that Um, I've been really into this idea by uh, D.T. Suzuki, the Zen author from back in the day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, one of his notions is that uh, intuition is the ultimate form of enlightenment. And by that, he doesn't mean your Daniel Kahneman system one, you know, intuition. He means the if you can track down to the root of the earliest of a rising of your consciousness of your thoughts and your idea and listen to that more closely that is where the fullness of what you are exists and where it arises so it arises there then it passes through you know the memory the heart and then ultimately the intellect and then by the time it comes out it's so modulated and morphed because your inner critic is talking your way of thinking of like okay how can i how do i need to change this so that i'm not vulnerable or so that it it is more affable or it has a greater conviviality or something like that for the audience or the people or whatever it is, or my partner or whatever. So everything that arises, we have this instinctual core pre, almost pre-conscious conceptual thing that comes from the root of our consciousness, but it always gets twisted and pulled out into, into weirdness. And we go around because of that. And a lot of it's because of fear and whatnot. And, um, but we end up expressing shreds of our natural brilliance because that thing is like a receipt printing out. That is the fullness of the the completely integrated all of what we are and all of our potential as well. And then it gets shredded by the intellect and then we get, you know, potential confetti instead of actual wisdom. So what I've been doing is like listening to that thing. And I spent a lot of time in my meditation, like just trying to, just for fun, like (laughs) from relentless curiosity, like trying to track back the very early or as early as I can, the arising of thought, like where does the thought come from? Where does it enter my brain? And through that, I was able to begin to shed some light on that arising, you know, intention, that arising uh, instinct type of thing I was talking about. And, uh, (laughs) and I found that in every case it was 
Corey is hungry. <laughs> Corey wants to fuck. <laughs> and it was, actually, it was actually two things. Yeah. <laughs> the origin of, you're like, son of a bitch. Yeah. I really thought I was more complicated yeah, than that. Yeah, sorry, guys. Is it too late for a rewrite on the book? I'm going in a whole different direction. It's now. Corey the- is hungry. Corey is horny. That's all I get <laughs> when I get down to the root of it. Yeah. Um, but the more I listen to that, that intuitive arising and express that, like not in a careless way, but uh, honoring that, I, it's amazing how much more of everything and how much more honesty and how much more of that thing comes out sooner. The fullness of what you are comes out. Like you were talking about, you started on it and you had this idea, this instinct to do it, but it got twisted up and shredded up because of the hall of mirrors that was inside there to get it out. And it came out as this thing. But then the more that you allow... Well, yeah, and, and, we can, and we can track that too. I thought oh man, there's so many supplement companies. Like I can't be a supplement company. I'm yeah. not big enough. Like I'm, I don't have the, who is, who is like, I can't do a real, I got to find a niche. I got to find something that nobody else is doing and, and do this in this way. That's like this very niche thing that, cause I felt like that was what I was capable of doing at right. that point. Like I didn't believe in myself big enough to believe like, yeah. No, actually, I can make a full-on human optimization company, you know? So I had those self-limiting beliefs. So this desire, which I really always wanted to create on it, kind of morphed, confettied into this, okay, I'll just make hangover pills. <laughs> yeah. I'll just make hangover pills because that's like, it's neat and tidy. And, and low you know, stakes, and the partiers are going to blow exactly, up your spot. <laughs> exactly, right? And so, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And then eventually you get enough courage, yeah. you know, to actually express the truth of, the truth of what that origin source to drive right. would be. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to like, you know, even putting courage on it to me seems a little, might be pressure and feel, make people feel pressure. I think it's almost um, the acceptance of what is. It's just sitting with like relaxing into what you are, being comfortable with your being and realizing that like, all right, we are all these infinite completely like kaleidoscopic constantly changing fallible and incredible critters that have no idea what's going on and we're all we're all confused and scared and excited and trying to do the best we can on a planet floating in the middle of infinity okay that's what's happening so calm down (laughs) you know what i mean just chill we're all on the same spaceship earth here and relax into what you are and allow that to come forward and just watch empirically the more that you express that uh, honestly and allow that to come through people will start responding to you differently and that will allow you to author your future ultimately there is an element of this in which you have to have the ability to see the difference between your actual intuition and that source of like your knowing that's coming from your soul, mm-hmm. which is ultimately coming from a place of love and, and growth and like what we're here to do. And also fear, yeah. which has a really tricky way of masking itself as that intuition. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I remember, I remember one time we were talking about, I just had a conversation right before this podcast. So it was about feminine intuition, right? And it was with, uh, it was with a, a group of women and they were talking about the power of feminine intuition. I was like, yeah, totally. Like I get it. Everybody has intuition. I think you know, feminine intuition is a trope, and and in some ways, maybe there's some truth to that being an aspect of if you're going to make this division between masculine right. and feminine, it is traditionally on the feminine. Whatever, who gives a I, fuck? Yeah, they're more intuitive about different things. Yeah. So all right. So whatever, whatever. You know, I'm I'm in with it. I've seen it. You know, and I think men have in the aggregate probably a tendency to be a little bit more cerebral women have maybe an aggregate to be more act more on feelings i don't know maybe the research pans that out maybe not maybe it's just a bias yeah, maybe you'll get me to i mean canceled tomorrow yeah. or whatever <laughs> you know i don't know i don't know what the actual yeah. the actual facts are about that but like there's but there's two elements of that it's not like everything even if you believe that it's not like everything that is an intuition is true right like i remember <laughs> i remember when whitney and i first started dating she came over to my house and she goes to take and we were monogamous at this point and she goes over to my house and goes in my shower and she goes who the fuck shampoo is that and i go uh it's yours <laughs> she goes no it's not who the fuck shampoo is that and i was like it's yours <laughs> you know like for sure this <laughs> is yours and then she's like she's all mad and i'm like i'm gonna leave for a minute and uh-huh. let you think about right. this shampoo and she's then she comes out she's like oh man 
I'm sorry, I forgot that was my friend's and I brought it over because I didn't want to bring my own shampoo. I did bring that last yeah. time. And I was like, there you go. So like, it's not that our intuition is always right. Like right. she had an intuition, which was based on fear, which was based on a model, which was based on a personal history mm-hmm. that said, you know, people are fucking liars and, and cheats and he's lying to me and this yeah. is it and this is some bitch's shampoo and yeah. I'm gonna fuck that bitch up, you know, <laughs> like, whatever. I'm projecting what was actually going through her head, but whatever was actually going through there it wasn't right. And we do that a million times. I do that a million times too, where like I'll have an idea that I think is my intuition, I think is my knowing, but it's actually coming from a place of fear. Yeah. And like the the ability to track like is this where is this coming from that's yeah. a really high level skill yeah if you feel that in the body what you're talking about that's like the difference between you can kind of map this over it's the difference between hunger and craving mm. so think about the difference between those two things and then map that over to the difference between an intuition coming from you know your, your the root floor of your source and something coming from fear or some you know nebulous nefarious what's another n-word nasty <laughs> negative <laughs> there's a lot of Di- bad of n-words stuff. right yeah yeah hmm. all right well i guess we did it <laughs> yeah well there it is <laughs> there it is all right so so the, that's an interesting place because i think that's another tool that people can use is like where is this coming from in the body yeah like where where do you feel it? that's actually one of the ways that i use when i'm trying to discern whether i have something that's coming from I call it my soul mm-hmm. and I think it's it's partly from you know I really like how Paul Check uses that language particularly and he tracks like listening to your soul I think it's a good way to do it but it could be your consciousness um but I, when I'm trying to listen to my soul versus listen to my mind I can hear my soul and I'll have sometimes contrasting things especially when there's something that like let's say it's um whether I should do tobacco or drink or do something that's mm-hmm. like pleasurable right like there's oftentimes two different voices that i'll hear one says yeah go for it fucking go go do it like fucking yeah hit that thing Mm -hmm. you know and the other one will be like nah bro like you shouldn't do that and then i'll actually have to be like okay where are these voices coming from because they're good at like masking their voice especially if it's something that you really want and like you know that if it doesn't sound right you won't do it so it'll the mind will mask itself as the sound of your soul so it gets tricky but the one tool that I've used that's the most helpful is like, all right, where is this voice origi- originating from? My soul seems to originate from my heart, right? Like from my mm-hmm. center, center. Mm-hmm. And like, that's the one that I know like, uh, okay, that's actually the the guidance there. And then the one that's originating from my mind, like face area, face, throat, mm-hmm. that region, it'll sometimes drop close, but it never quite touches that center, you know, heart chakra mm-hmm. point where I know that my soul is originating from. right? And it's not that my soul is always like, don't drink, bro. Sometimes my soul's like, yeah, go for it, man. Yeah. You know, it's not like the people, there's these conceptions about piety and these conceptions about all these things. It's not true, but your soul can actually guide you in all kinds of choices. Yeah, and also that the, that they're not connected. You know, they, it's right. a two-way street, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think a, a good thing to do in that moment to see which is which is to just pause for a minute go like you know do something else for a few minutes go get into a conversation have a glass of water or whatever come back one see if you forget about that desire altogether because we're you know silly monkeys that forty thousand thoughts a day and if you step away for two seconds your your brain is going to be on something else you know what i mean but if that thing's still when it's snooze bro then it's (laughs) right wyatt not when it's snooze bro (laughs) and then uh you know then you can check back in and be all right is that thing still in me and in, in why you know yeah yeah i think that's a good i think that's a good point i mean stepping away giving space especially when emotions are particularly present yeah like there's no del- there's no greater diluting factor there's no it's like trying to see through the fog mm-hmm. like when your emotions are present know that you're just going to be manufa- you're going to be a story manufacturing machine Definitely. and it's going to be creating these amalgamated monsters of stories with fragments of logic just stabbed in like fucking shish kebab (laughs) onto this clay piece of nonsense yeah like that's what emotions do like well blah 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 blah, justifying it on this false illusory scaffold that you're trying to create to justify the feeling that you're ultimately feeling Mm because your brain needs to justify the feeling but really the feeling is primary and it's just going to completely cluster fuck your ability to think about anything right so how do you solve that? Well, let's let's 
Let's take a little space. Yeah, a little bit of space. Just a little bit of space. Yeah, that's one of the things that go into the book a bit is how so much of our our life is just reaction. It's this long chain linked reaction of the things that pop up in our life and in our mind and how you can change that way from reacting to life for a day, an hour, a month, 10 years, whatever it is, to cultivating that space that you're talking about and then responding to your life instead of reacting to it. Responding to your life instead of reacting to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, because then you have agency in your exactly. response. Like, yeah. If you're responding to something, then you have that moment of pause, mm -hmm. the moment of now, the moment of choice, and then you can choose your response. A reaction is a response, but it's almost an in, it's almost by nature somewhat involuntary. Has exactly. A, has, a, has a ratio of involuntary components to it yeah. it might be the right reaction at some points you don't you don't have time for the proper reaction yeah. that's like an athlete right yeah, like you say, yeah, someone you're throws out of the way a, of a bus <laughs> someone yeah someone throws a jab and you yeah. react by slipping and counter jab do that all the time like, yeah right, like, whatever your thing is like that is the that is a reaction yeah. that you want you don't want a response exactly i'm responding to your strong hands with my <laughs> counter face. punches yeah, with my face which is really what you would be responding yeah. with if you took the time to pause yeah so there are some instances in which reactions are appropriate right. we're talking about new brain not ancient brain yeah here. we're talking about like actual life yeah, yeah where, ancient like, brain ancient brain it's good to we can't there's no airtight it's airtight there's no space in ancient brain the yeah. amygdala is going to be in control because it's like the the cone in our prefrontal cortex is like the ice cream scoop that's on top of that there's no getting around it i actually call that the evolutionary hangover that's one of the things in the book that's one of the things we're dealing with right now you know in the the way that we're fresh out of the jungle still it's like crazy as it feels like as humans we've been around forever but um you know, one of the things I note is that like technology has evolved so much faster than humans have because biological evolution takes so long is that there are still hunter gatherer tribes in the Amazon whenever amazon.com will deliver your groceries to your front door in two hours. It's like, how can those two things coexist, right? So we're amongst this overwhelm of technology and a lot of those paradigms from our old ancient brains are creating a lot of suffering in the modern world. You know, even if, if you, someone works in an office or something like that, these things get translated to the modern world by you, you, your boss is having a bad day or something and you engage with them and then you think, oh God, are they mad at me? And you start feeling anxious and worried and freaked out because what does that boss represent in the modern version of our ancient world, right? They're the tribe leader. They're giving us our biological survival tickets. That's the source of our food, of our shelter, of all that stuff. I need to be within the good graces of this person or else my physical reality will be challenged because if I don't have any money, then how will I live, right? So there's this whole paradigm of like feeling anxiety whenever really that, you know, your boss or whatever is probably completely self-consumed thinking about something else and they're not irritated or whatever at you but people have this reaction because they're living that amygdala part of the brain is still informing a lot of modern behavior but mm -hmm. you can begin to understand and balance that through a rise in that self-awareness of what's happening and then learning the tools and tactics to then recognize those arising feelings of anxiety that are reactionary and begin to mitigate them and and calm them and that you can, you know, of course, that goes to every part of life in general. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, we're, so we're in a weird time right now, you know, we're yeah. in this weird, weird time where we're all like struggling to, <laughs> to understand how this new world works and how it shapes. And it's causing a lot of suffering. You know, you look at anxiety and, and just overwhelm and depression and feelings of loneliness, all that stuff is higher than it's ever been before. So it seems in the most affluent countries. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I think also, so the example that you gave with the boss has a very clear representation of some physical need that mm -hmm. is being met because money translates to food, translates to shelter, translates to a lot of these different things. I think it gets even trickier when you start getting the amygdala activation and the fear response activation amongst friends and lovers mm -hmm. and people like that. Like people who's, you know, you're actually divorced from any real, real biological necessity for what you want, you know, like you're right. going to be okay, but, yeah. it, but you want it. 
And if you want something, like to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. You know, so like if you're with, if you have a friend and you really want to be friends with them, (laughs) right? You're going to look at every missed handshake, every time they delay a text, everything that they don't do, like you're going to be afraid that they don't want to be friends with you. So you're going to interpret that and your brain's going to create these fear-based stories because you're afraid of them not being friends. You're going to interpret that as them not liking you mm-hmm. or they are not interested or whatever whatever that story might be when yeah all right it's possible that that's true of course it's in the realm of possibility but most likely they're just fucking busy doing right. their shit like it doesn't it doesn't matter and when you have a real friend you know that that's like you don't it's just a friend it's like someone that's it's the friendship is it's easy it's like it's it flows as as clearly as like a, a water droplet down a windshield right it just finds the point of least resistance like if we don't talk to each other for a little while it's not like we're worried like oh man like Corey's gonna fucking hate me or like aubrey's gonna hate me you know and like we we know that we're just we're friends you know what i mean like this is just what this is just what it is and when you have a friend like that it's a different thing but even if so even a friend as long as you want it and you're afraid of not having it you'll interpret things a whole different way and if it's a girl and you want to be with that or a guy and you want to be with that lover or partner and you want want to be with them so bad you'll interpret them not liking you or you'll interpret them wanting somebody else. So you'll interpret it in all the fear-based ways, which is, it's a tricky thing to navigate because how do you not want things badly? And then, you know, if you do want things badly, how do you want them but not be afraid of not having them? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and that one's completely like based on ego and self-identity. Right. So you want these friends, you want whatever the relationships are, because if you think that if you have them, they'll somehow increase your value, your self-perceived value. Yep. And so by those things beginning to fade over the horizon, then there's like an eraser for the size of your <laughs> ego. It starts, you know, Michael J. Fox singing in Back to the Future. Oh no, my foot disappeared. <laughs> you know, those two powerful friends haven't texted me back in a while. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think that one of the things I... I'm happy that I've heard more of recently from listeners uh, of the podcast is like people have said, okay, so through listening to the show and hearing the things you've talked about, I've got this stage one level of mindfulness where whenever I feel anger or frustration or fear of any of those things that you were talking about, I've learned how to not blow up at my my partner or yell at my kids or whatever it is or get really clingy and weird with friends that I you know hope, hope that they will text me back. I've learned to feel that arising, not express it into the world and let it, you know, fall into what I call the mindfulness gap. You know, it's like there's this pit between thinking and doing and you can throw whatever you want in there into oblivion, right? And ultimately the goal with a lot of that is just cutting down the time that you're feeling in that negative destructive state and waking up to, okay, here's what's happening. Here's the trick that my mind is playing on me. Here's all the the parts of my ego that are trying to draw my attention and draw me into this this story and then being able to undo that and let that pass and come back to what you know would be the present ultimately but a higher sense of self-awareness of what's going on and really just it's returning to sanity ultimately yeah. and and so <laughs> and so uh you know the people you know it's great that people have gotten good at that but then problem number two comes with they say all right i've gotten to where i don't blow up with my kids i don't get weird and clingy with a friend i don't get mad at my partner but over time i start to feel resentment because mm-hmm. i'm the one that's always taking on water and then let and figuring out a way to turn that poison into medicine i'm the one that's always doing that work these people are living rather mindlessly, so it seems, or they're living, you know, based on their programming and family inheritance and all that type of stuff, their genetic reinforcements and so forth. And I'm the one that's having to deal with all this, so I start to feel resentment. And this is an important next step, and it also goes directly with what you're talking about, in that when you are being intentional and you're allowing you know feeling those negative things to arise letting them go and practicing that way of mindfulness um but whenever that resentment arises or you start to think of like well man you know what i texted aubrey two months ago and i never heard anything like that is a little maybe that is weird that whenever that thing comes up then it's time for communication Mm. so communication is the next step of that but communicating in a way that is of course open understanding that none of us know the full story about anything 
and suspending your assumptions, you know, because it's so easy, as you said, to create this whole story. Like we're all ultimately lawyers. We're like all litigating on behalf right. of our subjectivity, right? right? And because we want- Exhibit it, A it, and yeah. Exhibit B <laughs> prove that you exhibit me. are an asshole. <laughs> yeah. All the way down to Exhibit Z.2. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, exactly. So suspending some of that stuff, letting the jury rest, and just being open and communicating. And it's amazing how once that becomes, you become comfortable with that, then that becomes a teaching for everyone, right? Because if, if you know, someone, your partner does something and you feel like you're the one taking on the water and, and letting it go and you start getting irritated by it, but you're like, okay, I'm going to be cool. Like, you know, <clears throat> I am the Aubrey Marcus anyway. I can't, uh, you know, be, <laughs> go be an asshole. I got to keep it cool. Then you realize that, okay, it's hit that point where it's, I'm holding on to that now and I'm getting some like some tar stuck in me from this. I need to communicate about that. And when you do that in that open way, without judgment, without assumption, oftentimes they'll tell you something that will go, oh, now I see why they were acting that way. You'll learn something as to why they were doing that. And then a lot of cases, those people won't realize how, uh, that they were doing those things that were causing the frustration in the first place. Yeah. And so everyone kind of gets this bonus. You learn more about their world, they learn more about themselves, you know, and so everyone kind of gets a gets yeah, a, a growth then, out of it. And the goal should be that you can get to a place of like a deeper level of understanding and acceptance so that, and I think initially, like especially, you know, because I was in a very public open relationship, a lot of people come for open relationship advice and I funnel them over to Whitney because that's her career. And I think actually her medicine to be able to provide is to dive into that. And I don't have particularly the time and space except amongst friends to do that. But I think it starts and the communication itself is fucking overwhelming yeah you know because there's so much stuff going on and you can try and stuff it like you can try and stuff it but you can't stuff yeah. it it's you like just, trying not to vomit or something yeah, you just hold all the steam in a just, teapot it's like good luck <laughs> it's gonna come out somewhere you just can't yeah it's just not possible it's just gonna build and build and build and then when it comes out it's gonna come out as an explosion yeah. and i was i was a perpetrator of that same thing like no no this is cool like i'm cool with this yeah and then like day four of her trip to the fucking bahamas i'd be like i'm not fucking cool <laughs> with this you know and i was like fuck you know like, and, <laughs> honey why are you shooting your machine gun on the edge <laughs> yeah, of the cliff again yeah. at the sky <laughs> just relaxing <laughs> yeah and then i think so you have to be able to when you're going through some challenging stuff like there's going to be a period where that communication may seem excessive right and like the compassion for uh an unre what is an, a somewhat excessive level of communication but a necessary necessary level and then as you transition just have faith that you're going to need to communicate about that shit less like as your friendship evolves right and you really start to see that person and understand them you're going to need to check with them less and be like hey everything cool man we good yeah you're not you're going to need to send that text less exactly you're going to need to check in with your girl or guy less yeah you, you only know? need so many bridges to connect two right. parts of a cliff and once right. you build those bridges then you're, okay cool now we've got some some conduits of understanding here totally but if you don't and if you don't like go take those basic steps of communication then you have all these blow-ups and then the blow-ups kind of create these kind of like they reinforce your, yeah. your, your case. <laughs> and yeah, and they create these this residual damage yeah. that you have. Then you're playing cleanup because there's little pieces of shrapnel, you know, from these instances and these little traumatic encoded memories of like if you rush at someone with your emotions and they receive that, they may forgive you, but like their nervous system is primed totally for that experience again and it's not like we we've all done it and it's not like it can't be healed as yeah. like maestro alberto said anything can be fixed but dead like we can all <laughs> heal this shit that that is there so don't worry like don't beat yourself up if you've had anything that's happened in the past it's all fixable but nonetheless like the more you can avoid that by like getting in early and just be like whoa yeah i'm like witnessing especially if you say it like this like wow i'm really witnessing a lot of anger coming through if you can get that far like then usually the conversation can be pretty chill and you can like kind of work your way through it like wow i'm witnessing i'm feeling a lot of anger welling up and then if you add in like and i'm using the story that this is why right mm -hmm. like so that way you're not actually trying to claim a fact right it's just your completely subjective experience like yep. i'm witnessing or i'm feeling this and this is the story that i have about it right 
If you go, if you can get that far, communication is going to be fucking so smooth. Yeah. You know, because then the person's like, okay, well, what you're, you know, what you're witnessing, like I have total compassion for, and the story you're telling is not an accurate story based upon perhaps the story I'm telling, you know, and I'm open to me being wrong, but this is how I'm actually feeling now. I'm feeling like I love you very much. And I was just not aware that i was doing that mm-hmm. i was in my lack of awareness and and so you can have these interesting conversations and get to the bottom of things quick yeah but if you go like i'm fucking pissed because <laughs> you're a bitch and you did this <laughs> that's not gonna get you very yeah, far that's not good well it'll get you far just in the wrong direction <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is not the way that's gonna like actually resolve anything it's yeah. just gonna escalate then the other person's gonna be defensive and you get in this fucking battle absolutely man and i do think that uh you can fix dead and that's by birth <laughs> yeah true, I think right? if, if with every i want to like a video of a bunch of caskets closing and the babies being born like one in one out one in one out well that goes back right. to that everybody graduates <laughs> right. right like uh but i don't think people like to hear that they don't like, like to hear people, because people, people first... would hate to go to the shaman and be like listen i have a solution for you <laughs> yeah you're gonna die <laughs> yeah and you'll be reborn yeah don't worry about it <laughs> but don't worry about yeah, it yeah people don't like hearing that their personality is just like this veneer but you know that's that's not well, that's for well, them to deal with well tough cookies yeah. but yeah man one of the funny things about you know communication is that we as we were talking about earlier with the desire issue is that like we don't even know what we're thinking <laughs> you know what i mean mm-hmm. that's the problem is that we think and i think that writing is a great very useful and clarifying tool in this regard and anyone you don't have to write a book you can just um write you're just personally i don't you know you don't have to journal but you can just try and write out an idea at some point like what am i thinking right now let me write a thousand words no big deal it takes an hour you know and just put that down it doesn't have to be finished but just write out this idea and you will be stunned by how little you actually have thought out the idea that you thought you had that felt so expansive right yeah because uh, from a Jungian context one of the things that i think god's probably just got a little pretty little perked up whenever i said that <laughs> yeah. um one of the interesting things is that every time that someone says Jung, Godzi gets one feather on his yeah. wing. It's like, well, totally. like, 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 a, like a pixie dies every time yeah. someone says no one believes in it from Captain Hook. Like anytime someone says Jung, he sprouts a pubic hair. So <laughs> what's yours? What's your, what's your magic word? What is my magic word? I don't know. I, that's a that's weird a good one. question i'll think about it <laughs> that's a good one every time someone I says i don't wor- know I had magic words that came in but i don't, <laughs> don't want to say them yeah. i don't want to utter mad feel like it gives away my power Smart. yeah if i actually say then people will be able to use those magic words i'll be like on stage and a heckler will come up and be like they'll say it and they'll be like that was the magic fucking word <laughs> now what am i supposed to do Smart. you named me you ever read patrick rothfuss name of the wind no Oh, it's great. All right. It's, it's like the best, I think it's the best fantasy genre with the, one of the best like prose authors other than Cormac mm. McCarthy I've ever read. Nice. And it's in the fantasy genre, which is wild because, um, but anyway, he talks about wizards and one of the special powers of wizards is they can, there's a special class of wizards, they're called namers and they can name things. And when they name something, they have power over that thing. Mm. So, like the name, if you have the name of the wind, <laughs> it's like a Buddhist idea. Yeah, if you have the name of the wind, you can control the wind. Interesting. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think there are words that we have that have certain, maybe not in the magical context, but that have special powers oh, of that. Yeah, the words are definitely spells that are being cast. They're little spells, uncertainly. Um, yeah. So back to the pre magic <laughs> word tangent. Um, whenever we're, you know by the byproduct of understanding ourselves we have to almost talk out the thing we have to talk out our thought or idea and as it's coming out of us like the the pieces and fragments of our subconscious are unifying into conceptual things that are turning into language as we're saying it we're understanding it and as it gets out of us then it becomes a thing that we can then see and reflect upon and that's why a lot of times whenever anyone is talking, you kind of don't know what you're even saying, but it, as you're saying it, you begin to understand yourself more as it's mm-hmm. coming out. And then you can kind of, if you're talented at oration, you can kind of get ahead of it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, now I'm gonna like help this string or this piece of yarn come out like the magic trick, you know? Yeah. But it's very interesting. So in communication like that, it's so wonderful and, and powerful to be able to comfortably talk those things out because then you can find out what you actually think yeah that's really that's really important and then so what you actually think how much you were actually able to think about it writing actually really helps that Mm -hmm. 
one strategy that I use too when I'm trying to like track what is actually reality and what is my story is I write the words when I'm doing these writing and sometimes I'll actually do these as voice recordings like free flowing thought recordings Mm -hmm. um, because I have a a little bit of an editor's kind of brain when it comes to writing and sometimes I'll like reread what I wrote so uh, but I can do like free flowing writing um but i also like free free flowing like record like mm-hmm. voice recording cuz mm-hmm. i cuz i know i can't edit it you right. can't go back and go like actually a better way to rephrase <laughs> that would be would be this but anyways i start with saying what is true what is true what is true and then like take a deep breath and then that like primes me those those in a way that's a spell mm-hmm. right those are magic words to me like what is true what is true what is true and i've told you know, I'm in. I'm not in a relationship now, but I. But I was trying to explain when I was in this tumultuous. I was like, there are magic words that you can use for me if you fi- if you see me emotional. You know, like and like some of those. And I'm telling a story like, what is true? What is true? What is true? Like, let's say I'm in like a depression, or let's say I'm in like this thing. Like, those are magic words to me because I know that I can't. It almost forces me. Forces that squirmy part of me that would like to squirm a story that's mm-hmm. like not true, I like I won't do it anymore. You know, it's like, that's like the magic, what is true, what is true, what is true. Yeah. And then I'll be like, okay, yeah. I gotta fucking figure this out now, for real. Yeah. You know, I can't, I can't bullshit myself. I can't, I can't violate those, that spell that's mm-hmm. been broken. That spell has power over me. Yeah. You know, you say word true three times. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I believe in that. Yeah, it's a great way to draw yourself back to a space where you get an overview of your current experience so that you yeah. can then go, okay, like I'm experiencing this right now, but this is going to change and shift over the next hour or day or whatever like that. Mm. I think it's a wonderful reminder that one, all of our feelings, good or bad, are temporary and, and elusive and fleeting and fluid and that we'll get into these different states. And that's, you know, um, so useful for someone who has a, a serious, serious depression because people get in that state and it can feel so infinite that that's whenever something like you know suicide, the idea of that can arise. Right. But just realizing and being able to understand that, okay, this thing, no matter how much it sucks, this isn't life. Think about yeah. like how this is a small percentage of what I experience and being able to just take that step back and draw yourself into actually what is, into the truth. I think, yeah, that's super valuable. Yeah, I, I think that's also why depression has been such an effective tool. I mean, uh, ketamine has been such an effective tool in treating depression mm-hmm. is it's like a temporary pause from the stories that are being reinforced, reinforced, right. reinforced, reinforced, reinforced. De- uh, ketamine is a dissociative by mm-hmm. nature it pulls you away outside of the current container that you're in you know and allows you to look back at it and go like huh interesting yeah you know look at that the press fucker over there like that's how i feel all the time <laughs> yeah so that's like uh and i think that's also what the psychedelic experience can do it's just it's just even more powered because instead of just pulling you out it's actually pulling you out and taking you somewhere else right. which is also equally interesting and so a lot of the you know, psychotherapy, um, kind of psychedelic psychotherapy workers that are, that I know, they say like ketamine's like halfway as effective because at least it pulls you out. Mm-hmm. You know, it pulls you out of your condition and allows you to get some perspective. It just doesn't take you anywhere else, particularly. It sometimes can, I suppose. But it doesn't take you to like, MDMA will take you to that radical place of saffety and universal love and psilocybin can take you where, I don't know, all the fucking places or ayahuasca can take Spaceship. you to all kinds, of, all kinds of places. Yeah, yeah. yeah um but yeah it's interesting it's cool that these tools are now coming online because as you said there couldn't be a better time yeah there couldn't be a better time that we need it than now Mm -hmm. you know and so everything from the tools like all of the approaches an unconventional approach to modern mindfulness right you're talking about meditation for now yeah not meditation for how it was when you know cricket was a, like the biggest sport in the world because all you had to do was kill 21 days of time yeah. playing a sport you know like, yeah there was a time when like that made a lot of sense even though all right whatever big cricket fans like i get it it's cool i watched it too it's awesome you can go to sleep for a week and then you'll still be watching the same match <laughs> it's fucking amazing but like it's diff- different times call for different things right you know and i think that's one thing that your book you know does such a great job oh, of thanks. is like applying these principles 
to our lives now. Exactly. Not like the lives of a someone living in a monastery or an ashram or yeah. some way that it's already been translated. It's like, okay, mindfulness, meditation, these practices, not then, but now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you think about a lot of the, the big uh, famous books about present-minded living and mindfulness or a kind of a cultural culturally relevant um take on those that ancient wisdom those books are 40 50 years old at yeah. this point you know and so some of them are still dope like, oh they're all no they're all like, still go dope. read alan yeah. watts for yeah, sure yeah yeah they're, you know, they're go read anthony DeMello, like for sure but yeah know. but to speak to the specific challenges that we're all facing today Correct. is a whole different thing and also i found that really it's through my podcast you know whenever I lived a life of facing these challenges and over figuring out ways to overcome them. And whenever I started talking about them on my, my podcast, just kind of, um, you know, just randomly, just sharing my experiences and how I figured this stuff out, people would email me and be like, oh man, I, I experienced that right now, or I, I experienced that. And the way that you talked about it was really helpful for me and it helped me understand it in the context of a person living in the weird, strange times of, of this modern world. Mm -hmm. and. That was one of the things that made me realize like, oh, these are all, these aren't me experiences. These are things that everyone face in one way or another. Yeah. And also it made me realize that now is the time to be that person who can talk about these things in a way that resonates with this generation, that resonates with people that, you know, things that are happening today in, in the ways uh, of all the things that we're dealing with today in the modern world. Yeah, no doubt, man, no doubt. All right, I have a personal question for you. Okay what you're someone who navigates the uh, what you could call the astral which is the world of visions and the world of kind of mindscapes that you can navigate and actually communicate with people mm -hmm. check in on people see things it, it's a it's almost like a tapping into the collective in a very weird form of the collective that comes visually and through a variety of different ways what is the what is the mechanism by which because for me there's certain times and I, and I know paul selig uses the the idea of like a radio dial that's like mm -hmm. either tuned into the dial or not sometimes like i'm just like constantly tuned into that like i close my eyes and i'm seeing visions mm -hmm. like i'm in like i and i'm not high on yeah. anything i'm not like i know people love to imagine me like fucking smoking weed <laughs> right. all day and like ripping mushrooms yeah and, you know, <laughs> that's rare everybody yeah. <laughs> usually it's like just some fucking coffee yeah and like a few supplements like right. that's my program so um but sometimes for like extended periods and that's been like for the past few days it's been like ah, oh, like i close my eyes in the shower and it's like all right well here's visions of fucking psychedelic flowers mm -hmm. and different things why is that sometimes and why is sometimes i close my eyes and it's just black and nothing mm. i think that it's i mean i know exactly what you're talking about and all of my meditations are highly visionary yeah. um, and i guess the best way to describe it is like when you're in the throes of ayahuasca experience and your mind's eye is like just like popping Blown and it's part of time that's the same type of thing that i you know in my meditation that's basically what happens after about five minutes or so the party starts um <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then that's pretty much the way it is cl until close to the end um and then from from the end the last you know third of my meditation is what i call the watcher which is just pure no mind mm -hmm. awareness um but i think that that the conduit of that level of awareness opens and closes because it is connected with you know the all the elements of our body and like based upon what our body how we're feeling where our mind is at like our body and our our brain and you know the source or whatever you want to call it is applying its attention and uh, tending to a part of the garden that needs the attention at that moment and so you're being served by something, yeah. but you may not be as clear or as apparent as whenever you have that mind's eye type of mm. situation. It's just like breathing. It's like, well, why am I not breathing in all the time? It's like, well, cause you gotta breathe out too. Yeah. You know, it's like, why, why do I just eat? And why do I have to go to the bathroom? I wanna just eat, you know? And it's like, <laughs> well, no, it's a part, you got, it's gotta go in and out. And I, to me, that's my guess at why that is. Yeah, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting thing. You know, it's, it's a, uh, and sometimes things are available, like sometimes yeah. like really clear communication is available. And I think both of us, 
we'll sound like kind of like woo woo whack jobs and right. we really talk about like what we do in the astral when we're able to access that like uh, and i'm open to this being complete imagination and mm -hmm. i think you are too like i don't think oh, we're attached yeah. or invested to this being in actuality but like yesterday i woke up at 5 30 in the morning and like i i like need i needed to have a conversation with somebody in the astral mm -hmm. And I had a, they're very fucking interesting conversations when you have them with somebody in the astral. Right. And very educational because they say, I think, I think that most of us, at least for me, I can largely predict what a lot of people say. I think maybe that's one of the reasons why our friendship has been, you know, something that's <laughs> been so ever present because it's yeah. the, it's the surprise and delight of something that you don't expect. Right that's gonna come from somebody yeah. that really makes it like really interesting and exciting. And those are the people who I find myself, I enjoy myself around the most, you know, because you can kind of predict it, but almost always in the astral, even if it's somewhat of somebody who in regular waking life, like you can, you pretty accurately predict what they're gonna mm -hmm. say to you and how they're going to express because of their patterns. They're right. basically a, in the astral, they're fucking wicked intelligent mm -hmm. and like wicked, like, and they don't always have to agree with you. And like, I've gotten in some long protracted like <laughs> astral disagreements, but they always make hella good points, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, it's very fucking interesting, man. It is. And maybe that is just my mind, you know, playing devil's advocate and taking their side sure. and then coming back at me like, with some smart. shit. smart. I can't I believe like, how smart they are. Dude, for real. <laughs> like I had one of those yesterday and I was like, damn. He's like, I mean, this is a draw. Yeah. And like overwhelmingly, I end with these astral discussions like, that was a fucking draw. And maybe that's because mm -hmm. it's me versus me. Right. You know, it's like spy versus spy. <laughs> like I'm just fucking <laughs> masturbating myself with a conversation. But I end up learning something. Maybe it even is. Even if it is me, fuck it. Yeah, and that's it's me win. adopting yeah. another perspective yeah. with all of my faculty to look back at me through their lens mm -hmm. and my imagination. Great. Because right. I learned some shit. Because I'm smarter today than I was yesterday because of this astral conversation that may have actually happened or not happened, whether I imagined it or not. It doesn't fucking matter. But it was it was like potent. Yeah, that's the weird thing about the brain is that it's always trying to make itself realize things, which is really <laughs> funky, you know? It's like your subconscious is always trying to get the conscious mind to become aware of what it knows. Yeah, And so it's like, but if you zoom out and look at that as a self-contained system it's really bizarre um i tend to think of what you're describing as um again you know i think our subconscious mind uh, donald hoffman is a neuroscientist i love that's been on my podcast a few times and he has a great theory of recursive subconscious awareness so he's someone who mathematically thinks that your subconscious threads go on for infinity essentially they just go on forever neuroscientists often agree now that there's you know multiple threads of subconscious happening and our conscious is kind of this harmonic glow of all of those happening together but to us it seems like a singular conscious awareness but really there's a bunch of different stories happening under the surface and if you look at dreaming we have these deeply symbolic visual uh things that emerge during our dreams and we can yeah. extract understanding from those and the story and whatever and symbolism I think in that astral space that you're talking about, one way of looking at it is that it's through the practice of meditation or psychedelics or whatever it is you, you use to get there, that the membrane between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind becomes rather opaque or a bit more thin. And it mm -hmm. allows while you're awake, and I think this is why it kicks on every time in my meditation, um, and it's probably just a happenstance of meditating for 20 years and also mm -hmm. doing a lot of, you know, brain stretching type of situ <laughs> situations. Um, is that uh, they say when you're making bread, sometimes you should stretch the dough until you can see light through it. I think maybe that's what happened to the, the membrane between my subconscious and conscious mind. <laughs> but <laughs> wherever you go to, to you know, in meditate, all the, just like when you're dreaming or when you're in an altered state, all the fragments of un... Uh, unorganized subconscious concept and awareness begin to emerge and they become visible from an aware state and so the reason why in the book i put you know i'm going to show you how to meditate you do it every night while you're sleeping i'm just going to show you how to do that while you're awake and the reason why you need to do it while you're awake is because you need to have the aware agency the the awake part of the mind the conscious part of the mind to to deal with and to understand and to reflect upon what's emerging from the subconscious yeah so 
all of these these fragments that are arising, we turn them into these stories and we're able to see all the symbolism, but then use our intellect and a you know in a kind way to then learn and, and start to parse out some of what those concepts mean and what some of that stuff that our, our subconscious is trying to show us. Um, that's one way that I look at it. And in that, that's an extremely, extraordinarily clarifying practice because my deepest insights, my the and also the most apparent insights come from those moments in my meditation. And a great thing I've learned to do is just not question them, not even put them off. Like I'll go from meditating, I'll have you know, these things, these thoughts, these ideas or, or actions arise, and I'll literally get up and go do them, you know, and instead of like, well, I'm going to write those down and then I'm going to forget about them. Yeah. It's like, no, I just do it. They come up, I do them. And then magical stuff starts to happen, you know? And so yep. perhaps another way of looking at it, and I don't disavow that it is a potential possibility, um, perhaps there are, there's a connective web of resonance that is, if you look at something like panpsychism, the idea that, well, it's a hard problem of, of consciousness. It's like, well, why is it that our brain, something that's made of carbon and hydrogen atoms, why is it that that has consciousness in it and that combination of atoms put together whenever this table or whatever that's made of the same stuff, why doesn't it have consciousness? That's the hard problem. And panpsychism suggests that um, all cells have consciousness at a cellular not aware awareness or agency but they have the formula of consciousness so one could take that idea and swirl it around into this notion that um i do believe in a literal way that resonance plays a huge role in our universal equation right so mm -hmm. just like in music when there's resonant frequencies or tones or whatever you have the resonation of someone's voice um you feel someone you hug them you feel the resonance this that that kind of vibratory connection, um, that doesn't stop at just music or things that we can feel or that are very apparent to us. I believe that every action, every thought, everything, and, you know, and this goes beyond just humans, everything, it's this giant soup. The cosmos is this giant soup of vibrational resonance moving in every possible direction and swirling around and creating these strength, strong forms of connections. It's just like whenever the uh, you know the opera singer sings and shatters the crystal glass, it's because the sound vibration coming out of her voice is loud enough and it's the same frequency as that glass, so it resonates so much that it explodes, right? So imagine that phenomenon happening. I only trust you because you're a sound technician. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be like, I don't know if that's true. Somebody Google that shit. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, I trust you. That's why it happens. And so um, or even in your car and you're play you have like bass playing or something and it makes your window rattle or your door uh -huh. rattle. Same thing. It's like resonating the door frame. And so, you know, our resonant, our vibration, our frequency as even if you don't want to look at it in a mystical way at all, you look at it from a purely scientific materialistic way, a reductionist way. Our nervous system is electricity. Like our brain, there, you know, we, our brain, we have thoughts because there are electrical signals being fired from one neuron through a synapsis to another. It's all electrical expression. And some parts of me think that this conversation is already complete and we're just simply haven't allowed it to arise yet. But all of the causal conduits of electrical movement that will happen in our brain is already predetermined and will unfold anyway. <laughs> and we just have to see like a couple of puppets and allow it to unfold, <laughs> but it's already predetermined. So, um, this, this, I think I agreed with you up until the last one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a possibility. You never know, All right. depending on your views of free will. But um, so, you know, if you look at that view of the world, which, you know, in our ayahuasca experience that we're in together um, right before this podcast, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, one of the great things, like I was asking, you know, as impossible questions I could think of. And one of those was what is the purpose of all of this, why all of this, other than just, oh, sure, it's a beautiful cosmic drama that we're all on stage playing, but why the drama? Why build the theater? And it's like, because the, the whole goal of everything is to refine the code, the cosmic mathematics of the universe, to basically, like, it's in the Big Bang created this giant, um, huge problematic math equation and ever since then entropy has been causing it to simplify and become more fluid and collapse in on itself and our generation and the way that we connect and flow with resonance and express it with us as source coming through us we're like filters that are they're simplifying the mathematics of the cosmic code right 
of the of the sacred fractals that are the creative force exactly. of all things. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you talk to Paul Selig and he, you know, he gets his guidance from the guides and believe that however much you want. Um, but he says the way to understand the self cannot be understood without understanding the environment that from which it's in. I wish I had the exact words mm -hmm. he uses, but like we are a piece of a piece of the whole and like when you try to talk about the self as separate from mm -hmm. the environment like as separate from the resonance of everything around it it makes no sense yeah like you can't do it's a fallacy to say like this is me and this is table and this is this yeah and it's also you know that goes in line so that's his spiritual teaching which goes exactly in line with something that you know don howard would always talk about mm. which is where we did ayahuasca which yeah. was you know he calls himself an animist in which he believes everything has spirit yeah you know and that's an old both native american and you know psychedelic tradition where you recognize that all things contain spirit there's spirit in all things and it's all a way of saying the same similar idea that's right that like this idea of separateness this is me distinct yeah is kind of bullshit it is i have a practice one of the practices in the meditation section of my book is called cosmic camera and it's a way of becoming aware of what we're just talking about it's a practice yeah. you can do um well so fuck there's probably all kinds of amazing practices <laughs> for everybody in there that's right um i only got to you know what i only got to read this is the now i got this copy i only got to read like the portion that was available when i wrote the fort mm -hmm. so i'm fucking personally excited about diving into this <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. and doing it um but i do know your approach i've sat down with you on these group meditations and uh the part that i did read was fucking phenomenal and Thank blew you. me away so i'm honored to have uh to been a part of this process and i'm excited to see the refinement and this is the first day i think either of us saw the hardcover yeah, <laughs> yeah of this kind of thing amazing. and it's um it's amazing, man. It's amazing to watch you on your journey and see how you've evolved. And, um, you know, I'm looking at, and this is my own judgment, but I'm looking at, you know, the, what is really clear to me is the, the happiest and best and most clear Corey that I've ever seen in mm. my life. And it's fucking beautiful to see, man. <laughs> Thank so I'm you. just super happy for you and, um, super for happy for people to, get this book and, and dive in and check it out well, thank you so much man and uh, that means a lot to me and just all of the you know i was thinking about this the other day is that all of the stuff that we've experienced together and all of the ways that you've been such a like just relentless um champion and like uh supporter like everything i've ever done or tried to do you've been there like <clears throat> excited and like down to say yes do that or like i'll help you in any way i can and like do that and just the belief um really just means so much to me and i think a lot of the stuff wouldn't be possible uh without that and i was thinking the other day like if you make everyone else you know feel the way that you make me feel then you're doing something right in the world man oh thanks brother well that's a good that's a good signpost then for me to for me to hold out there because to me it's very clear that like the thing that i'm interested in is unconditional love mm -hmm. like the world of judgment is something i'm still deeply invested in but it's less and less interesting with every moment yeah the world yeah. of unconditionality and like being able to be a force for that and i'm able to touch it every once in a while with different people where i really can show up in that way like that feels the best it does and that's one of the things you know, I, I put in the book is like um, I built it as it's a bridge from knowing to doing. It's not something to read and smile and feel good about and then go off and then run to the same yeah. stuff. It's literally like ways to change your life. And one of those is you can think your way into a better view of the world. You can think your way into that way of unconditional love through recognizing those things that arise, recognizing those states of judgments and not indulging them. Mm. You know, you are the thoughts you turn into action, not the thoughts that pass through your mind. Yep. you know and by thinking even one small step at a time if you're the most cynical person i was i was a narcissistic little cynical prick whenever <laughs> i was a kid you know and it's on it so of course it's just because i was full of anger and frustration and resentment and all that stuff and through time it was how i woke up to presence by accident by looking at who i was and realizing that by deciding to indulge unconditional love and re in recognize judgment as it arises and let it go and continue to do that that i was changing and changing and changing as each yep. month went on i thought wait a second that guy doesn't exist anymore yep and he may show up again yeah that, that narcissistic little prick may yeah, come for sure a moment and i and sure will and like <laughs> and that judgmental you know you know 
egoic needy validation hungry version yeah. of myself that i've really like oh he that guy may show up too and that's okay yeah. like, like love though love that guy when he shows up like oh hey buddy like i haven't seen you yeah, in a long. you're, you're not smarter than come everyone here, else come here, trust me come here cutie you don't you don't have to drink every day to make yourself dumb enough to feel patient to listen to other people you're come good. here, you're come good. here, cutie. Yeah. Let's let's, yeah. let's cuddle for a little while. I'm gonna say goodbye soon, but that's always the way. Yeah, love you, brother. Great love to you see too, you, man. man. Everybody, now is the way. An unconventional approach to modern mindfulness with the forward by yours truly. Uh, Available everywhere, and you get to listen to your beautiful voice. That's right. <laughs> if you get it on Audible, I'm sure yeah. it's gonna crash on Audible as well. Thanks. Um, look, look at these quotes that you got on the back. You oh. got Emily Fletcher, Danielle Bellelli, Shinzen Young. Shinzen Young is fucking awesome. Yeah, he I is. love that dude. Yeah. It's great. It is. Um, it, what's nice is I'm gonna keep this little pre-order incentive going too, so uh, Binaural Beat fans will enjoy this. If you go to nowistheway.com and there's a variety of ways to order the book there, just for a few days, handful of days after the book publishes, um, if you go there, you pre-order it, you can get two free binaural beats that are made specifically for the book. Cool. Uh, one of which I think is the, the most potent I've ever created. You also get a, a meditation ebook I wrote called The Five Points of Peace. You get the audiobook of that, which contains guided meditations. So it's a what's lot of the, What's the URL for that? Nowistheway.com. Nowistheway.com. Good to see you, my brother. Yeah, and good to too. see you, everybody. Peace.